Hello everyone and welcome back to Unspoken Stories. This is the official YSJ podcast for the YSJ Beyond the Walls anthology. I'm your host Ben and I'm here with... Tom, hi. Uh, Tom, I don't think you've been on the show too many times before. I have not been on once. This is the first. Basically today, we were going to have an interview with somebody but they cancelled so we're doing this kind of fallback plan. Today I want to talk about writing in games. This is something that interests me personally. And me, to be fair. That's why I've invited Tom on the show because they're the only person who likes the games that I like. <laughs> I'm just going to be yapping a lot this episode about games that I like and writing in them and the history of all that kind of stuff. But to get the formalities out of the way first, the book launch is now confirmed. It's happening on May 17th, day after my birthday. Uh, hopefully Rachel will bring me a cake, isn't that right, Rachel? I'm going to bring you a car and a caterpillar cake and frosty drip. Mm-hmm. Sounds wonderful. But yeah, it will be in the SU bar, I believe. 6.30 p.m. 6.30 p.m. Get Time your tickets. Upstairs, get your tickets now. Upstairs. Show up. yeah. Upstairs. It's going to be crafty. It's going to be fun, and we're all going to have a good time. Of course we are. I mean, there'll be alcohol, so... Tom will definitely be having a good time. I will be there, for sure. No fun is mandatory. No free bar, though, no? Unfortunately not. Damn. Never mind. Never mind. No free drink tickets, I'm afraid. Anyway, with the formalities out of the way. So, writing in games is something that interests me, personally, quite a lot. Like, it's had a long history, and to start out, games didn't really have a lot of writers. Or, like, writing wasn't too important to them. So with early games where it kind of started with stuff like Doom and Quake, mm-hmm. so obviously you've played those, Tom. I have. I mean, in regards to writing for games, it wasn't even really. It was an afterthought, as you say. It was all about the gameplay first, developing the game, and then whatever kind of fitted in story-wise, just to kind of tie it all together. That's kind of how they did it, just as and when in the groups, the small development groups that they had, to be fair. Yeah, it was an odd, like, conflict, because it, you had John Romero and John Carmack, I believe. Is that yeah, yeah. Uh, John Romero had wrote these really like oddly long-winded like paragraphs that would in, like show up between levels that, yeah, that yeah. detailed the story. And but on the other hand, you had John Carmack who made the famous quote that game like story in a game is like a, a story in a poor. <laughs> it's just not important. I have not heard that one myself. It's quite a famous uh, one. That has changed drastically over the years. Like, but yeah, no fair. I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, obviously. And then after Quake, you had. You know, other first-person shooters that came out, like Marathon, which had really crazy in-depth lore, but no one really speaks about it. It went on to become Halo and stuff like that. The Bungie people, yeah, for sure. But I think the first big change, I think you'll obviously be a big fan of this, was when Half-Life came out. Half-Life's the one for me. Half-Life is my series. That is my jam. I mean, for that, they got on Mark Laidlaw, who was published writer by that point, who worked for the company well into, what, 20 years just about 20 years well, right about now about re- two and everything he quit quite recently though. he did yeah no he quit a while ago and funnily enough he actually released his ideas for Half-Life 3 mm-hmm. which is still stuck in Valve time um, never to be released hopefully fingers crossed one day but yeah he has gone from the company now yeah sadly but when Half-Life 1 came out it completely changed how people thought about writing in games no longer just paragraphs in between levels, all the levels were seamless. You'd have actual NPCs that were talking to you and were like major characters. And but it wasn't in cutscenes. That was an important thing. That you could was walk the around trick. Around. That was the trick. Just making a tiny seamless no speaking character that you can essentially just imprint on from start to finish and it added into the gameplay elements as well in that you are just the lone survivor or a survivor trying to escape. Just the immersion that was built in with that was a massive change, massive change to the industry, I found. Obviously, yeah, Half-Life has a really, really in-depth story, even in the first one, but it was never told to you quite directly. It was more just things you had to figure out through things like environmental storytelling, which Half-Life kind of pioneered in a way. No, you totally. have, like, corpses in a Doom level or something like that, and they didn't really tell you anything other than someone died here. But then when Half-Life came out, you was more, there was a much grander conspiracy that you slowly learned through playing. Like you learn that the Black Mesa facility where the game takes place is doing a lot more than just regular, you know, normal science. Science, yeah, you know, no. Questionable ethics, that kind of thing. Questionable ethics, <laughs> totally. Which is a chapter in one of the games itself. No, completely. You go from start to finish slowly piecing it together. Uh, when the military comes in and starts slaughtering everyone, that's the shock as anything else in the game. Um, all done with scripted events. That's what Half-Life really put together, the scripted in-engine events that, as you say, weren't part of the cutscenes. Yeah, cutscenes. Cutscenes, that's the one. Yeah, I think it would have taken away from the game to just have, like, a cutscene where you see a scientist shoot, uh, a soldier shooting a scientist and Gordon looking really shocked, something like that. 
Well, no, it's all the game. totally. Again, Half Life changed everything really with that because the only other games that kind of put writing at the forefront and story development like that were early RPGs, things like uh, Baldur's Gate, mm-hmm. the first Baldur's Gate, and Baldur's Gate Three that everyone has played now. Fallout One, Fallout Two. Yeah, no, they were absolutely massively amazing for the time. Fallout 2 went really off the wall with a lot of real-world references. Yeah, pop um, culture things. People kind of hate it for that. Totally, but actually it was really good fun. I mean, you've got the hubologists in Fallout 2, which were essentially just Scientologists mm. in a futuristic wasteland. A lot of people really didn't like that kind of thing, but actually it brings a lot of depth and a lot of fun to yeah. what it otherwise would just be a really depressing game. Mm. And then you had things like, I think it was Daggerfall, was the first Elder Scrolls game. Arena was the first one, but that was literally just a hack and slash RP- RPG. And then Daggerfall, which was the second second one, that was an entire continent of characters and things, which took years to finish, absolutely years to finish. But yeah, the writing in those really harks back to D&D campaigns mm-hmm. um, and letting people choose their own adventure. That's where that kind of stuff comes from. So it's quite interesting to see where game development has arisen from that and it's not even just in the writing and the choosing your own adventure it's about building a character and your skills and everything like that it's amazing how much as i say that that has developed from D D for mm-hmm. sure well i think like like all rpgs really trace their lineage from tabletop rpgs fallout came from i believe it's called the GURP system yeah which was more you can put into any setting but they kind of things like that I think Doom originally came from a D&D campaign. Like they got the Cacodemon idea from oh, great. a D&D oh, of campaign. Where they yeah, no, there is a monster just like that. I'd never even thought about that, to be fair. But yeah, no, I'm sure back in the day, all these 90s nerds that were making computer games were all massive D&D nerds back in their school days, for sure. And it was the only way you could really get decent writing in a game before things like that. Yeah, totally. And the early RPGs, it was more an effort to try and put tabletop RPGs onto a computer. When you play the original mm. Fallout or Dark Fallout, it's all about just rolling. You you miss, you RNG. miss, you miss. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Which can be frustrating. I mean, game development's come a hell of a long way. Some people still really enjoy the RNG elements, but not for me. Mm. I am not a turn-based kind of guy anymore. I have not got the patience for it. I'm a basic bitch these days. Just give me a gun and something to shoot and I'll be, yeah. Uh, You're happy an action days. RPG guy. Totally. You know, I think with table to- uh, turn-based, sorry. They put more importance on stories. It's more about walking around, talking to the characters, and dealing with different situations. Again, there's uh, loads of different schools of philosophy to do with RPGs. I think the original Fallout ones is more you just go from place to fa- place to place, solving moral dilemmas. Like the yeah, whole, sure. the whole loop of Fallout One was just going from place to place to place to place to place. There's a one overarching problem of you know getting your water chip back to your vault, mm-hmm. but every now and then you encounter a town. The town has a problem. What do you want to do with it? Yeah, completely. I mean, that even just comes straight into the like more third-person action RPGs instead of the turn-based ones. I mean, that's, again, developed straight into that as from there. Skyrim, Elder Scrolls, Morrowind, even your online ones like ESO, World of Warcraft, not to an extent like that. But, yeah, I mean, it's all developed and, developed and just a general evolution of where these guys developed it in the 90s, for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, with RPG, moving on from RPGs a little bit, RPGs and things like Half-Life established something that games can have good writing. We don't need to just have shooters where it's just a paragraph in between levels and things like that. That's when games like Max Payne came out. Mm-hmm. Love it. Yeah, I assume that you were around when like Max Payne was in its heyday. I remember my brother bringing me back that home for my birthday. I should not have been playing at that age at all. It was a very, very dark game for its time. But again, that totally developed kind of the neo-noir Mm-hmm. style of many computer games since and that entire team that remedy team them have been at the forefront of narrative in computer games ever since for the past i mean that came out in 2001 i think so mm-hmm. like 25 years 24 23 years they've been at the forefront i mean they've smashed out max Payne, quantum quantum break quantum break quantum um, leap to show. Yeah, I, I get it mixed up sometimes Quantum Leap, yeah, no, not quite the same. But yeah, Quantum Break, where they're bringing in um, one of the first proper Hollywood actor where they're scanning the face and bringing those guys in. Didn't they have uh, like a TV show on the side as well? They just did. Quantum Break. It was very experimental back in that kind of era, but it never really kicked off. Nowadays, it's obviously more about developing a TV show completely on the side. And it's amazing how far that's come, actually. Um, back in the day, TV, film 
development from computer games harking back to like the original Mortal Kombat they were always absolute pap um, fun but absolute pap so yeah I mean obviously with Fallout TV show I mean that's absolutely massively kicked off have you watched that yet Rachel? I haven't but I was going to say is now the time to tell everybody that you're actually the oldest person in the group and not me <laughs> because when you say Why about you <laughs> <laughs> because you're talking about playing Max Payne at far too young of an age. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Just to clarify, Max some. Payne came yeah, out two years before I was born. <laughs> we're not even going to say that. I was going to bring up the Fallout TV show, though. I thought you said um, you were going to watch it. I w- was, and I was also going to bring it up. And I didn't do either. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you. It's really good. You should watch it. I have watched the Fallout TV show. Yeah. And I'm pleasantly surprised because it wasn't completely terrible. What do you mean it wasn't completely terrible? I liked it. Terrible. I, I went in thinking it would be completely horrible. Really? Every- yeah, fair. Why? See, these days I I'm am a optimistic. diehard Fallout fan, and the biggest haters of Fallout are Fallout fans. Yeah, for sure. I mean, well, you've got the different it. eras. But the Fallout fans are the people like the originals, the ones we were talking about back in the day. They hate the third person Bethesda ones, and then the Bethesda ones hate the new ones, and the TV shows. It's sad because, I mean, more Fallout. More Fallout. I absolutely love it. I, I liked the TV show. I Like, it's better than whatever my expectations were which were absolutely nothing i thought it would be horrible as most game tie-ins are i would say it's considerably possibly the best computer game tie-in probably yeah would a non-game playing gal like myself enjoy it do you think i honestly don't know i i went into it from the perspective of someone who's played almost all of the fallout games trying to find out everything like oh this didn't happen this didn't happen Mm -hmm. do i recognize this from anywhere a lot of it la- harkens back to the very originals, which yeah. a lot of people haven't played because they are archaic in design and really hard to get into nowadays. So uh, as someone who did play those back in the day, they have taken some liberties with the story, but if it makes a good TV show, I don't really care. It's a solid TV show and you should watch it. I will. I was also going to ask you guys about The Last of Us because, again, it's a game I definitely have not played, but I watched the entirety of it oh, you on, did? The, on the plane home from LA last year, yeah, and I really liked it. Alright, hello, Jet Setter. Okay. But yes, you really enjoyed <laughs> it anyway. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, but, you know, Pedro Pascal. That is true. I mean, he can't really go wrong. Can't. The internet's daddy, is it? The internet's daddy, yeah. I just genuinely enjoyed it, like, as a show, like, the cinematography, everything. I thought it was, like, a really well done. Right, it's, it's HBO, definitely well done. And I don't think HBO really go wrong very often. I have um, not seen The Last of Us. But I haven't have you played, not? I, we no. haven't played the game, so I didn't know if anyone who has seen it, obviously you haven't, so you can't answer it, but... Have you seen it, Tom? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, to the game, they took some liberties it? and stuff, yeah, but right. I'd say it's up there with... I mean, it, I absolutely loved it. Again, they took some liberties in regards to the lore and the way their well, world works and things. I um, was going to say, like, okay, for example, a game like The Last of Us or Fallout, you know, how long do those games take to play? Well, The Last of Us is great. I mean, these days it's got a beginning, a middle, and end. So that's the kind of thing I've got the time for. Yeah, the Last of Us is made very much. Last of Us about 16, 20 hours. Yeah. Okay, While so a Fallout game can yeah. take you 200 hours to get the I most out of it. I was going to say, like, in my head, I had the number 40 for some reason. So, like, imagine taking 40 hours of gameplay and, like, say, all that story building, all that world building, all that lore, and then putting it into a TV show that maybe is like a six episode run. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you're, ha- you're may- maybe halving it, if not quartering it. It's so difficult. You've got to condense stuff, right? You really do. As you were saying before, I mean, with Half Life changing from cutscenes, which Last of Us does have, but a lot of it is done through just general storytelling of the world building as you're going through it, playing the game, talking to Ellie and Joel uh, between them and getting their dynamics as characters, as the father and daughter kind of thing they've got going on. Surrogate. Um, surrogate, exactly. There's some of that that's going to be missed, but I mean, at that point, I guess the people that run these TV shows have just got to hope for the best that the writing's up to par and the actors can do the most with it. As you say, Joel, Pedro Pascal, absolutely smashes it, Joel. Um, I think he's probably the best choice they could have chosen. I can't think of anyone better that could have really got Joel's gruff kind <laughs> of minimalistic kind of approach to life as much as Pedro Pascal smashes it out of the park. The gruff, angry dad archetype. Totally. Pedro Pascal's really good at that. I can't think of anybody else that could have done a better job. But I think the difference being that uh, with The Last of Us, it's a very linear game. Mm. It's more just a, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end with these same characters doing the same thing. With Fallout, it's a lot harder because it's an RPG where you're more just one character in a world. And when you're making a TV show about that, it's saying, what character do you want to be? What character are we... What story are we exploring? That's true, but then obviously you've got the options with a game that's based on a RPG. You've got the option to do what you want, I suppose, in that sense. 
in regards to, as you say, a linear one, you've already got specifically the dynamics of the characters, but I suppose it must be quite fun as a writer in the Fallout universe to just play about and do what works. Go you've got well. a lot more yeah, options in that regard. Mm, Bethesda sure. made it the norm that you have to play as like a vault dweller. And like the show is about a vault dwelling woman, but they yeah, also yeah. do other stuff of like people who live outside the vaults. But obviously, in the second game, you don't play as a vault dweller. No. Nope. You play as a tribal, and in uh, New Vegas, you play as the courier. Just a standard wastelander dude, just trying to make his way. So yeah, no, they've they've got a lot of options to do with it. And I can't wait to see what they do with the second series, because it's um, just burned, isn't it? We can't do spoilers, can we? Um, definitely not. Ryan is shaking his head right there. Not when it's still Shame. Sunny. Yeah, shame. But yeah, we'll watch it. Well, I was going to ask about The Last of Us. Obviously, they're making a second season of that, right? Mm-hmm. Because I saw that Danny Ramirez has been cast in that. So a wonderful you know human that. being. Yeah, oh, yeah fantastic. Um, totally, yeah, I'll take so it. I was going to ask, how many Last of Us games is there? There is two. 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 Made, right? two. Who is he going to play then? Do you know? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Interesting. No clue. Because a lot of people... Well, well in the original it. film, Joel isn't a Latino. That's true. That's so, true. again, they can do what they like but with the it. The representation matters there as well. Yeah, I mean, do whatever works for it. I mean, if you've got the right actor, I mean, none of that really matters to me. So, yeah, no, I mean, the second one... Very controversial. Very controversial, just in regards to some of the choices that they made in regards to the characters. I loved it. The new character, Abby, I absolutely loved. I think it was, like, all right, but it's just people didn't like the the, the drastic change. Are we, are we allowed to, are we allowed to spoil? <laughs> it's been that long. I mean, it's been out about seven years now, I think. I'm not too sure. I don't um, want to break Rachel's heart, though. So, yeah. It's fine. I will definitely have forgotten it by the time the TV show comes Joel out. gets clubbed to death. Aww. He does, <laughs> by the main Africa. character you play as in the game. Okay. So you play as the person that kills okay. Joel, but he had it coming. He had it coming. Mm. Indeed, it, it, it was the life he chose. It is, totally, and that's a horrendous world that they're trying to build. And as I say, a lot of people were very attached. Again, a testament to the writing that people were so attached to Joel um, mm. from the first game. That the fact that he gets clubbed to death brutally, just... For n- well, for no reason, brutally, really affected people. <laughs> it's got a lot of a lot of internet people really upset. Which for me, I like to just get the popcorn and just sit back and enjoy it. But that's just me. Man, it says a lot about how like games writing has evolved that we can now really care about characters. It's totally. Like no one looks back at the Doom guy and thinks like, oh, what, what an amazing character. Yeah, he's more of just a power player. He's a yeah. power fantasy. Joel is to an extent, but. It's much more realistic, much more grounded regarding to actual human emotion. Yeah. But if we go back, you know, um, Wolfenstein 3D came before Doom, obviously, mm. and that was just a basic, like, Nazi killing story. I really liked what they did with the newer Wolfenstein games, where they turned DJ Blazkowicz, who was just the meathead protagonist of the of 3D, into, like, an actual character. Oh, yeah. Real struggles and things like that. Well, you've got that to an extent, but then at the end of the day, he does just like slaughtering Nazis, which. I can't go wrong with him. Yeah, but that's it's more just the game like demands that. BJ Blazkowicz is a real character in the sense that like he thinks that is there really any point in fighting on when there's such little hope in the world? It's all it's all about that kind of thing. No, that's fair. Yeah, I mean he does have yeah he does have his misses in the le- the new ones. They've got a baby come in and it's trying to create a world that's better for people to grow up in. I guess and um, you have got that kind of emotional depth to it. And what a better background to drape that on than a alternate history where the Nazis won. Yeah, because then it's just it's I think you put Nazis and in games and stuff the same they serve the same purpose as zombies where it's just you can just kill them. Who cares? Yeah, no, totally. They're, they're just like an obstacle for the characters to base themselves around. They're fair game. I mean there's no moral, moral quandary if yeah. you're going up against Nazis. Again it's like with zombies, it's not the it's not the zombies that matter, it's the people around them. That's why The Walking no, Dead fair. was so successful. Because yeah, it's, it's, the zombies don't fair. matter. It's more how the people react around it. Totally. Um, again, it's just a it's a backdrop to hang these characters on and just explore human condition mm-hmm. and how they interact with each other. So we've gone on a bit of a tangent, but uh, if we're going back to Max Payne, that was in one of the other like first games that really made writing important because we had people like Sam Lake. And if I go on a tangent, I love Sam Lake very much. We were talking <laughs> about Quantum Break and Alan Wake, I think he made as well. Alan Wake, yeah, no, he was part of that development team. Control, it's all part of the same universe, the same bigger, bigger stories telling, very twilighty. I haven't played Alan Wake 2 yet, sadly, but I did play one in American Nightmare and I enjoyed them very much. Great games. Um, I'm still to play two, again, getting the time in this day and age to play any games at all. Mm. Yeah, it's more just, he's a man who wears his influences very much on his sleeve. When you play Max Payne 1, it has that kind of crazy, like, 
there's a lot of weird stuff going on in the Max Payne one plot with like drugs being made by the government and put into the neighborhood oh, to make like totally homeless super soldiers and things like yeah. that. It has <laughs> yeah. like first writer syndrome. Do you think? Uh, I think it does, but it does it really well because it does it with such like pride. Oh, it is pure cheese by the end of it. I mean, it is absolute nonsense when you think of it, but it's it's still got that emotional depth. Yeah, he's just playing as like a New Jersey cop who has to deal with like this grand government conspiracy. He has, but it all links back to him in the end, because spoilers for a 22 year old game the corporation killed his family to keep the secrets at bay. Yeah, deep stuff. Yeah, obviously, I'd I just like to point out something as well. We, went, we mentioned Twin Peaks last episode and everything is coming back to Twin Peaks now because Sam Lake loves Twin Peaks very much. He wears Twin Peaks on his sleeve quite a lot. If you've ever played Alan Wake, you'll see the Twin Peaks like comparisons. Mm -hmm. Every day on Instagram he posts him like drinking a coffee with the Twin Peaks music on it. Also, mm -hmm. the person who played Dale Cooper in Twin Peaks plays one of the main characters in the Fallout TV show. Carl oh. McLaughlin. Who does he play? I don't know any of the these dad, people. Uh, the dad of the main character. Oh, oh, of course he is. He's yeah. the police dude the in Twin Peaks. Yeah, it's yeah, Dale yeah, Cooper. I've never seen Twin Peaks, but I've obviously seen little bits of it. And so yeah. everything is derivative. Everything is derivative of Twin Peaks. That's the ep that's the moral of the episode. Everything comes that from Twin Peaks. That should be the title of this episode. Everything is derivative of Twin Peaks. <laughs> <laughs> it always comes back to it. Anyway, uh, going back to games. We've seen kind of a like a resurgence of RPGs. Do you mm -hmm. think? With Baldur's Gate 3 coming out that I mentioned earlier. Huge, huge, huge game. I really like it. Everyone likes it. it it's, it's amazing. It's proven that like if you put enough effort in, you can make a really, truly like, in-depth, good RPG where you can do anything you want. And again, that all harks from D&D. It's in the D&D universe. And again, it's been so long since we've had like an RPG that big and that good. But I want to talk about another RPG that's really interested me. Disco Elysium. If we're going to talk about writing in games, we have to talk about Disco Elysium. A game I could not get into at all. Uh, it's such a shame, because on theory, uh, we were talking about this, weren't we? Uh, when someone tells you that you're going to love this game, or you're going to love this TV show, for me personally, it puts me off. I don't know why, but yeah, that's, that's the way it is. I'll see it later and totally agree with them. It's totally my kind of thing, but at the time, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Stop telling me what I like. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but in terms of writing, I think Disco Elysium is my all-time favourite RPG. Just all the characters, the way it's written, all the different interactions you can have with how you build your character, it's amazing. If you don't know, the general premise is that you wake up in a hotel room, completely plastered, you've drank your entire memory away, and it turns out that you're a cop and there's a murder mystery and you have to figure out who did it, all while piecing together your memory in this like world that you have to figure out what everything's going on in. There's a lot of political aspects and things like that. It's, it's a brilliant game. If you love writing, just like in general, if you love reading, if you love any amount of good writing, please play Disco Elysium. Even if it is like a game and you're not into games, it's really worthy. You're just going to be doing a lot of reading and walking around. I think that's probably what put me off, because mm -hmm. I didn't know what was going on. And sometimes I need to be in the zone for being able to just piece together everything from scratch. I need something to hook, hook into immediately, which I think is probably... When you're not in the zone, when you're not in the yeah, you have head to be in the frame, totally. That will be... I'll play it just for you. Thank you. And and we'll come back and discuss at some point how amazing this amazing game is. <laughs> but yeah, great writing, of course. It, it serves as a good detective game as well. If you want to serve like good writing in games, there's a lot of good detective games that you can uh, look out with that. There's a lot of Sherlock Holmes games who do that quite well. I think my personal favourite detective game is something called Return of the Orca Din. It's this little uh, indie game by the same guy with Papers, that. Please. Yeah, on my um, Papers, Please is fantastic. Again, such a strange narrative is Papers, Please. Mm -hmm. You are Good narrative, though. It's absolutely good fantastic. Writing. Yeah, again, it's another one that the gameplay really plays into the way they wanted to do the narrative. There's nothing else that quite really compares to that at all. What is Papers, Please, for people who don't know at all? Uh, it's Papers, Please is a story in which you are a border guard on a completely made-up... Soviet era Eastern Republic Art and Fox, I believe it's called. is that the one yeah, like, like you don't know mm -hmm. I believe it's called and yeah essentially you are choosing people's lives going through the border deciding if they actually get to go through um, judging if they're suitable to be in or not and eventually there's conspiracy there's a little bunch of conspiracies right. that you can choose to get involved with all through the gameplay of just saying yes or no on a passport or arresting people for having fake passports and stuff weird isn't it it's almost a choose your own adventure again harking back to like the choose your own adventure books that i used to play read as a kid but yeah no great great stuff 
Jasper you were linking that to? Yeah, Oberdin, which was, uh, I think his name is Lucas Pope. It was his next game after Papers, Please, I believe. Oh, uh, okay. And the general premise of Oberdin is that you are an insurance agent for a, uh, like, one of the East India Company type things. And you find a ghost ship that's come in, and the whole point is that you go onto the ship, and you find out what happened using this weird watch that lets you see the final moments before someone's death. Okay, cool. You can hear, like, all the dialogue and things that they said. You can see where they died, and, like, you get this image you can walk around with and see what happened to them. And then you just have to find out who the person was, how they died, and who did it. And that kind of thing. And that's you slowly cool. piece together what happened to the entire ship. A lot of weird shit happened. It starts off really small, like, oh, the captain got shot by this guy. The, sh- the captain shot this guy. The captain died. Okay, cool. And then it, it has things like krakens and, like, deals with underwater entities and like mutinies and stuff like that it sounds very Lovecraftian a little bit a little, a little bit. bit it's more like harking back to you know, the old like sailor stories where yeah, the okay, ship got fair. eaten by the Kraken yeah, yeah yeah no that sounds cool again we're talking about everything harking back to Twin Peaks but then you go further back everything harks back to uh, Lovecraftian horror of some kind or folk horror or folk, folk horror, horror. Folk horror. Folk horror yeah. mm. and obviously like you mentioned choose your own adventure books did you say that like a lot of games writing comes from that like them and uh, D&D and tabletop RPGs is that like yeah I'd say it all links in just hooks into some basic form of human like of being able to choose your own adventure I guess having control over the stories that you're playing through bit of a what's the word fantasy it's just fantasy at the end fantasy at the end of the day and power power players power power, power fantasies power fantasies in a way, that's the one yeah, definitely where Doom and stuff came from. Yeah, totally. I mean, where else can you run around shooting stuff left and right? But in terms of evolution these days, do you think Choose Your Own Adventure books is kind of like the primordial soup? Possibly. Like the TTP, TTRPGs came from. I'm only so old, so I don't know where they <laughs> they get their ideas from, but it all harkens back to that, I'd say, from from my perspective anyway. Yeah, it's all very... It's like a, a decent lineage that you can kind of track, in a way. I do have some questions for you guys as well. Sure. Rachel has questions. Of course. Fun. Um, so, would either of you want to become video game writers, <laughs> since we are doing a creative writing degree? That would be my dream job. That, that would be my dream as well. Really? Mm-hmm. We both the ultimate dream out. job would be working for Valve. If anybody at Valve's listening, I'll happily uh, take a job off them. Me too. Don't leave me out. No, is, no. There a, is there a twofer? Offer going Hopefully. anywhere? No, apparently uh, not. Apparently, Valve is very difficult to get into. Video game writing in general apparently okay. is very difficult to get into simply because some games still don't massively put the narrative first. So many companies just do their stories in house. Yeah. And otherwise, there's such a uh, difficulty in the amount of people trying to get into it. Um, apparently, it is massively. I've heard some, I've read some interviews with some game developers where they say just don't even try well that feeds into the second part of my question but I was going to say you and I have a mutual friend who works for Ubisoft so maybe you oh right, okay. just, for just a job at some get point in. yeah no totally you know, maybe your who former knows? colleague Nepotism. my friend but yeah my other question was going to be do you think there's any kind of for want of a better word snobbery around video game writing as an art form and do you think that it is literary in itself I think it definitely used to be very snobbery. Uh, I think Roger Ebert, the film critic, famously said that video games cannot be art. But I think over the years that that has definitely changed. That with has massively with things changed. like Disco Elysium and like other RPGs coming out, games have proven that they can be good forms of storytelling. It's not even the big games either. I mean, it's all indie games usually. Tons of indie games. I mean, if you want the progressive development and where the evolution of computer games is coming in i always look to the cheap indie games they're like 10 15 quid i just played one recently called planet of lana Mm. which is absolutely no dialogue at all but the world building and everything is done through the game itself and you get a little pet and he helps you and it's giant thing where your tribe and this other planet's been taken over and all your people have been captured and you've got to go and save them all and it is one of the most heartfelt games I've played in a long, long time. There might have been tears at the end there of might it. Have been That's tears. fine. It's okay to be emotional, Tom. It's not. It's okay for men to cry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Let's not let's not have any toxic masculinity in this recording booth. But I think snobbery has definitely gone down over the years. Especially with like w- w- like uh, around the time of Doom and stuff like that, no way people thought like game games can't 
You just yeah. go and you shoot things. You play Galaga at an arcade machine. There's no mm-hmm. writing there. But I think once series like The Last of Us and Fallout and more stuff comes to the mainstream, they'll find that actually... Even D&D has come to the mainstream now. With massively like like so. Stranger Things and like that Critical Role series that I haven't watched. Wasn't there a film? There was a D&D film. film. It was fantastic, right. actually. I it's thoroughly nice. enjoyed that. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, it's highly entertaining. But it's completely nonsensical and hilariously good fun. I think D&D is very popular now. Hopefully Warhammer comes next. I hope that gets normalised because uh, I need more people to play with. Yeah. Even as a non-game player, non-tabletop, non-video game game player, I can still like wholeheartedly say it is an art form. You can't deny it as an art form. Especially the now. The amount that goes into it, the creation of it, the storytelling, everything. I think anyone who is dismissing it is just a snob. I would like to plug one thing. My friend has a clothing company called Chaotic Good Co. Mm -hmm. And they make clothes for all your kind of nerdy needs. They've got loads of really cool D&D designs, loads of other stuff as well. So we will link that. But yeah, I think you guys would really enjoy what they put out. And hopefully anyone else who has any interest in this podcast might as well. How much do they pay you to say that? Nothing at all. I'm just a wonderful friend. Did you get free stuff? N- not one. He's like, he's telling me I need to pay. So this is just out of the pure goodness of my heart. Point Shout out, Chris. Yeah, Love right. You. Nice. No I'm just nice. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm just nice. I was going to also ask you guys, so like I've mentioned a few times now, I'm not a gamer, not a gamer gal, mm-hmm. but my personal experience with it is playing a lot of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 growing up, <laughs> because that's how old I am. A lot of Dave Nero's Pro BMX as well. <laughs> this wow. is all because of You're my brother. And a little bit of Tomb Raider, but button bashing is my forte. I'm probably dyspraxic because I just can't figure it out. Like, the yeah, coordination just is not there. Pure practice. Some, some people can't. Uh, I, it's just something you learn from playing for yeah. years, I guess. And Being a nerd in my teenage years. Yeah. That having that no friends. Having really. no friends, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to of say, but, but you, you've perfected yeah. that. But I would still play Tony Hawk now. Like, they've released like a. This is probably like 10 years ago. A few years ago. Now. They, well, ten years ago there was like the mobile game which I absolutely like was obsessed with playing, mm-hmm. and then they re-released Tony Hawk, didn't they? And I, just, I love it for the fun, I love it for the tunes. Give me that Black Sabbath, you know, let me just ride around on my little skateboard. But I have played one game of Dota. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> wow. One single <laughs> game. Because oh, of an extreme. Because of my aforementioned friends, like he is really really into it, like in a really big way. Yeah. And so I downloaded it on my like ten year old MacBook Pro which it could not handle whatsoever and the only thing I remember from it is just the flippers of agility oh and yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is it's been a long time since I've played that Dota. is my experience of gaming <laughs> yeah that's not the best experience you could have that is up there with the the top tier of especially like with writing like I don't think yeah. Tony Hawk and BMX games and <laughs> Dota 2 are like great for but as long as you enjoy it as long as you I enjoy had a great it. time and I I guess, can I call myself a gamer now, guys? Of course you can. Okay. Yeah. Of course We're you not going to be gatekeepers here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can name three games. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I, I do think. have What, Tony Hawk's 1, 2 wins? Three. No, Tony Hawk's first get a 2, Dave Mirror's whatever <laughs> BMX course, that was, yeah. and then one game of Dota. Nailed it. True gamer. True gamer. Damn right. Give me my badge. Old school gamer, in fact. Oh, gee. Card carrying old school gamer. Yeah, right. If anything, I'm cooler than both of you. I, have mm-hmm. to, I mean, that goes without saying. If you guys are done with that, I've got some quick fire questions, which is Ben's favourite thing. I've already told you what I like seeing at karaoke. Have you got any more? I've got some new ones, and Tom, it's his first time on the pod, so I think it's time that Tom tells us what his go-to karaoke song is. Um, probably Stevie Wonder. Anything by Stevie Wonder. Anything. Pretty What's the much. Catalog? Yeah, no, that's quite a good one. Okay. But I mean, I need to be drunk enough first, obviously. obviously. Oh, me too. Okay. I'm not. I'm not doing karaoke. I'm not. Drunk. I'm not doing Duran Duran without a drink in his hand. Oh, is it Duran Duran? Sorry, fantastic. Um, and obviously we are meant to be a semi-literary podcast, so <laughs> we we should probably not end this without telling everyone what our current read is. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing much reading, but I am doing a bit of writing. Like I said, I do want to be a video game writer. I am doing a little world building project, like a small fantasy thing. Cool. Okay. Just general, regular fantasy stuff. There's a few spins on it. Like a computer game bible of all the backstory and stuff. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah like the Fallout bible. I'm kind of doing my own thing with it. Nice. Good stuff. Just trying to expand on the world with that. What are you reading, Tom? Uh, the last thing I was reading was uh, Dune. Trying to get into Dune, the original, the old school sci-fi. But it is difficult because the first chunk of that book is just pure law and once I get past that I'm sure I'll really enjoy it. 90% of the book is just world building. It's all like oh, geopolitics it? and stuff. Oh fair. See I need a bit more I don't know. 
human interaction rather than just straight law. I like to just have that divulge to me naturally, mm. uh, which is a shame because I've actually really enjoyed the films. So I thought I'd really enjoy the books, but not yet. But I'll give it another go. I've only seen the first Dune. I love the new one. The second one's fantastic. I've heard so. The first one's just build up to that. Kind of, yeah. But the second one, there's a lot in it. It's sort of in probably about two or three books because there's a whole part of him in the desert becoming the dude that he becomes. Yeah. And it's only about 20 minutes of the film when realistically it could be like two hours. But it is what it is. It's better than the David Lynch film that tried to like cram all of the books just into one Still film. not seen it. Probably should just for the laugh. But I don't know, again, if that would just be horrendous to watch now. But who knows? I'm still reading Generation X, which I'm pretty sure I said in the last podcast that's what I was reading. But yeah, what's everyone also currently watching slash listening to slash what games are you guys playing because that's what this whole podcast has been about? Uh, I think the game I'm playing right now, it's called Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader. It's an oh, RPG. you're playing that? Yeah, yeah. That yeah. just went on sale. I'm very tempted to pick it up myself. Yeah. So it's decent. It's all right. Um, I'm only about like a quarter of the way through the game, I think. I've just been obsessively listening to the new Kevin Fist album, The Tortured Poets Department. That's the era that I'm in. And I am making it my entire personality, much to the distress of every single person around me, especially Ben. Mm-hmm. Swifty. Woo-hoo. Woo-woo. But yeah, back to the formalities, Ben. Oh yeah, uh, just to remind everyone that the <clears throat> book launch is on the 17th of May, the day after my birthday. It's at 6.30pm in the SU bar. The lounge upstairs, I do believe. The lounge upstairs or the bar. I can't remember which one. Alcohol, come down. Cake for Ben's birthday. Yay! And a book that you can hopefully buy. And a book, buy. of course, yeah, Sorry, the book. Look, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our cohort, sorry, has created Whoop. so lovingly. So yeah, it's going to be hopefully a good end of term bindage. And that should be all. Uh, thank you for listening. Hopefully we'll catch you next episode. Bye. Thanks, guys.